thought I would document the process that I go through for constructing uh, uh, bent metal parts on my scratch built Zenith 650. The part I'm going to be building today is a bracket that mounts on the wing spar. I had made one originally but uh, realized that I had installed it backwards so I've got to make a replacement. This is a fairly uh, straightforward part, just a single bend, which uh, most parts tend to be like that. Uh, so going off the Zenith plans, I almost always go ahead and CAD up the parts that I'm going to make. I use a program called Libre, and one of the nice things about Libre is that it has sheet metal uh, modeling built into it. So it takes into account things like the uh, uh, like the bend radius, and you can lay the lay the part out flat, and you can uh, get all the different links. Now, one thing I'll point out here is this red line here. This corresponds to the sight line of the bend, and I will show where that comes into play when we actually go to bend the part. But essentially this is the edge that you want to line up on. These right here are the tangent edges and that is where the uh, where the leaf of the brake will actually clamp down but you can't actually see that location so you have to do an offset and everything that I'm doing is an eighth inch radius bend so I need to go from the tangent line and extend out an eighth of an inch. So that's the purpose of this. So Going by my going by the program that I'm using, basically, my uh, my developed length is 47 millimeters, and my sight line needs to be more approximately 29 millimeters from the edge. So this is the part we'll fabricate. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is the surface <clears throat> where I will actually be doing my part layout. Now the first thing you'll notice is that this is a metal surface. And the reason I've got a metal surface is it allows me to use magnets. And that just allows me to keep everything pinned down and not moving around and of course that's going to improve the measurement accuracy. So the first step whenever I do a layout, of course I've got to have a way to measure and I've got to have a reference line. So in this case we're looking at a one meter uh, meter stick and try and get this where it's in the shot so that you can see what I'm doing and of course we want the meter stick to be pinned down so what I've essentially got here are half inch by three eighths inch magnets and they're very very strong and I have those because the material on the, uh, the thickness of the meter stick uh, if I try and use one of my smaller magnets, uh, it just will not hold down as well. So these will be off screen, but essentially they'll be clamping down. I'll use two of the magnets, and that'll be more than enough to keep everything in place. Let's slide this over just a little bit more. make sure everything's in view. So then the next part of the process is I use what are called parallels. Uh, I mean I have I do machining as a hobby so I have a lot of machinist type tools and they've turned out to be quite useful for, uh, do, for doing my layout. So one of the tools that I like to use is called parallel and all that does is I just put that up against the edge and that gives me a good zero reference whenever I'm doing my layout. So then the next part, uh, this, this uh, bracket that I'm making is 040-6061-T6 aluminum. So I just lay that up against of course my meter stick and then also make sure I'm butted squarely up against my uh, uh, against my parallel and then this is where the thinner magnets come in handy. 
I use the thicker magnets, it can be a little harder to move things around. And again, I'll be holding down with two or three, just whatever's needed to, to make sure everything's pinned down securely. And I'll actually have a third one off camera, again, just to sort of keep things pinned down securely. Okay, so the next step we'll do here is start doing some layout. Now the overall length of this bracket is 135 millimeters going by the plans. So the first thing I'd like to do is just know how far that I need to go. And this is another case where having the parallels uh, come in quite handy because these edges are all square. And of course it just lines up very nicely against what your... Uh, against the meter stick. So we just go ahead and mark that. Then the other thing I like to do is I like to mark which side is the measured edge. So I always put a little tick mark to indicate which side is essentially my zero edge. Now on the one hand this pin, the pin width is roughly about 0.5 millimeters but if you get into a situation where you're doing a lot of bins these little 0.5 millimeters could add up very quickly and uh, you could find yourself further off on a dimension than you prefer. So I always like to, to indicate which edge is, my, is the aligned edge. So the next step is to start drawing the horizontal lines. And in this case we are <clears throat> wanting a length of approximately 29 millimeters. Now in this case I like to use what are called gauge blocks. Again, this is, uh, the goal isn't so much you're trying to get within like a thousandth of an inch or something like that on your measurements because you're, you're never going to bend it that accurately. But where it does come in handy is just making it very easy to do layouts, uh, do these kinds of layouts. So I've already got a gauge block set up here to the, the length that I want. And all I have to do is just lay down the uh, lay down the gauge block, move my magnet off to the side, and all I have to do is just run my gauge block lightly across. I mean, you don't want to take a chance on on scratching your metal. Just run that across, and then, like I did on the end. I like to put a little tick mark to indicate which side is my uh, indicate which side is the uh, is my measured side. In addition, the other thing I like to do, as I mentioned in an earlier uh, mentioned at the beginning, is that I have this sight line that I use, and if you're not paying attention, it's possible to get the piece of metal you're bending flipped in backwards. So the other thing I like to do is indicate which side is my tangent side, what I call my tangent side, which is the side that will actually go in. So the other thing that I like to do to minimize the chance of mistakes is I mark with a little T to indicate tangent side. Like I said, it that just minimizes the possibility. The tangent side is going to be the side where the leaf of the brake presses down to hold the sheet metal in place. So this will be actually the side that will actually go into the brake and this is the part that will actually be hanging out. And of course just to point out as well, it's always, you know, uh, I've used calipers plenty of times and one of the again, one of the advantages of using the magnets is when you're needing to do your layout, you can always, uh, it makes it a lot easier with everything held down rigidly to be able to uh, indicate your measurements. So in, if I were just using the calipers, I would put a couple of tick marks along here and then I could come, come up with, the, uh, with either my meter stick or I could even use one of my parallels to actually draw the line out. Again, for me, I have just found it just as easy to, uh, to go ahead and just stack up the gauge blocks and then just run it along my meter stick to, to get the measurement. And of course, the other thing to keep in mind, I mean, the 
the purpose of using the gauge blocks is not to try and get your measurements to within a thousandth of an inch because you're never going to cut that accurately. Uh, the, the main reason for using the, the gauge blocks in this case is, is just for the convenience of being able to do the layout. So at this point I will go ahead and cut my part out. Go ahead and I mean I'll just use plain old plain old uh, snips just to go ahead and trim this off. I will not trim this off at this point since it's just a just a single bin. I'm going to leave that on here and I will uh, uh, trim it off afterwards. So next step will be to go ahead and go over to the brake uh, after the cutting is done and go ahead and get this part bent up. Okay, so we're now on to our next step of starting to bend our part. Now, I'm sure you'll probably notice the colors on the lines have changed. And that's because I had a little problem when I was setting up my shot. I accidentally, when I left my original part sitting in the brake when I was testing to make sure that the leaf was going to uh, stay clear of the camera and I accidentally bent the part. As Tom Lipton would put it on his uh, Ox, Tool Code, uh, Ox Tool Co. YouTube channel, uh, Mr. Bozo paid a visit. So I had to fabricate a new part, went ahead and uh, used blue ink this time. So first thing you'll notice is that I have the part oriented so that the uh, side that I indicated as tangent is pointed towards the inside and we'll want to get that lined up and this is where the parallel comes in handy again because I can lay that up against my, against the nose of my brake and make sure that I've got my sight line set properly and it looks like I've got it. So then on my brake sometimes the parts will shift a little bit when the uh, when the leaf gets closed, so I secure the part with magnets just to minimize the shifting. Now I'll go over here and go ahead and drop the leaf down. It's now down. We'll pull the magnets off, and then I'll go back again and check my sight line. And nope, it did not. Uh, something shifted where the nose moved, moved on me a little bit, so we've got to go back and do it again. Again, if I weren't ch checking that, that probably would have been, I don't know, at least a good millimeter or so of error. So I'm going to scoot this out just a little bit again, hold it down, verify with my parallel that I'm lined up. magnets in. You want to make sure that the magnets are clear of the nose of the brake so that uh, it doesn't hit the magnet and cause the part to shift. And we'll give it a second try. So we're back down again. Pull the magnets. And we're still in the wrong place. So what I'll do is I'll pause the video. Sometimes it can take several tries getting this thing uh, nudged into the right place. So I'm going to pause the video while I finish uh, uh, tweaking on this and then we'll continue. Okay, it probably wasn't necessary to pause the video. It only took me one try. Sometimes I can hit it the first time around and sometimes it can take me three or four tries to get it. But when I look down uh, with my uh, parallel I can see that I am hitting my line and I don't know, I can probably nudge this issue nudge this edge a little bit, but I mean we'd be talking like maybe a quarter millimeter or something like that, so uh, I certainly will not chase after that. So the next step in all this is to figure out how much I need to bend, um, uh, bring up the leaf of the brake. Now one thing I've done, and it'll, it may wash out here, is I keep a log of all the bins that I do, or I try to remember to keep a log of all the bins that I do, 
and I'll record the thickness of the metal, the target that I'm shooting for, which is 90 degrees in this case, uh, the value or the angle that's indicated on the leaf of the brake, which I'll cover that more in a second, and then after I measure the part, I'll make a note of what it was, uh, what the actual value was. Uh, the other thing I've gotten into the habit of doing is making a note of the length of the part that I've been I've been because quite often, or I've noticed as I've done several bends over time, that sometimes the angle that you get can vary depending on the length. And you know I've got several pages here uh, of of bends. So I'm going to look up here on an earlier one for an 040 and try and find something that's in a similar length. And I've got a bend here of about 230 millimeters at 040, which I'm not even sure if that's showing, probably not showing on the camera. And let's see, yeah, 230 millimeters, 040, and it looks like I had to go to 81 degrees on my... Uh, on my uh, angle meter. So, uh, some other values that I've got, I've got like 79 degrees, uh, so it's, it's pretty much in range. So, what I do for measuring my angles is I've got a little digital gauge that I use. I guess I ought to get the camera pointed to the right location. It's just a simple little digital gauge that I picked up at Harbor Freight. And what I will what I do is I clamp this onto the leaf of my brake. clamp that onto the leaf of my brake and I'll zero it. And all the angle measurements that I take and that I have on my sheet are measured from the, the leaf of the brake in that, uh, in that resting position. And I will raise the leaf of the brake until I reach that value of whatever it was I had before. It looks like 80, about 81 degrees. So going to reorient the camera back to the piece of metal. And probably lots of shaking going on here, so I don't know, maybe you need to take some Dramamine. And then I'm going to get my compass set up here. And it's got a zero function, so I zero it out. And then I will go ahead and perform the bend. I'm going to just do one last check here to make sure Nothing's moved or slipped on me. And then go ahead and start the bend. And usually I'll do it in, uh, do it in stages. When you've got short uh, leg lengths like this, at least on mine, of course, I've got this extra little support here. Uh, sometimes that the edge of this will try and dig into that. So I usually take the bends in several, in a, I'll try and take the bend in a couple of steps. So that's what I'm doing right now. Just a little problem here. I was wondering why my bend was not continuing. Normally I always try and make sure that, that the uh, leaf is clear and I had a wrench laying there because I had to adjust my adjust it a little bit earlier. So hopefully we didn't, th I don't know, we may have thrown something off when that happens. So we'll go ahead and continue the bend here. It's definitely moving much easier. Okay, so we've passed the 90 degree point and it's decreasing again. And we're at 83, 82, 81, point, 81 degrees. So we'll stop right there. And 
I need to go find my uh, find my protractor. So I'm going to pause the video for a second. Okay, so we're continuing on again. And one of the other tools that comes in handy for checking my angles is a protractor. And I believe I had bought this one at Harbor Freight uh, several years ago. And it comes in quite handy for checking uh, for checking my angles. Now, of course, it's hard to, I mean, you can't necessarily count on this on an, as an exact surface. Uh, in fact, one of the things I've discovered that if I, uh, if this were truly reading, I would actually stop at 45 degrees. But what I've discovered with this, as I've used it, is that actually 40 degrees is really... Will give me 90 degree. Will give me a 90 degree bend. So taking a look at this right here, we've definitely passed 40. We're probably around 43, so we're a little steeper than I would like. But we'll find out what we've really got after I, after I have uh, uh, pulled the part out. But we definitely don't want to bend it any further. So that 81, I probably should have gone more with a 78. I had some 78s in there. Uh, so we'll go ahead and pull the part here, and we'll see what we got for a real bend. So this is the part that you probably will not focus in. It looks like it could be a little overbent, but we'll see by how much. And it looks like we've over I've overshot it by about five degrees. So, if we can get it to focus, which it probably won't, we're showing roughly about 40 degrees, which uh, 45 would be a 90 on this particular scale. So it did go over a little bit. But we'll take a look and see if that one's a keep. I'll have to do a little checking to see if it if this one will be a keeper or not. But for the purposes of the video, uh, you know that sort of covers the basic techniques. Sometimes it can, it can be a little tricky to get the get the uh, get the exact angles. Okay, one thing I'm going to go ahead and discuss briefly is the use of a uh, of a surface plate. Now, a surface plate is a machinist tool. It's based it's, uh, anymore. They're made out of granite, and they're generally uh, uh, ground flat to under a thousandth of an inch. Uh, there's different grades, and you can get them at you know to within a ten thousandth of an inch, or even uh, uh, finer than that. This one, I think, is probably like half a thou. It's a relatively inexpensive one. Uh, import. I think I paid a little over $100 for it. Uh, they do make a slightly smaller one, 9x12, that you can get for $50 or $60. So this isn't exactly a really, this isn't a, an expensive tool by any means. Uh, it's definitely worth having around. The one thing I wanted to point out here was my uh, 90, uh, getting my 90 degree on here. This is a uh, uh, an angle plate, which is uh, machined uh, 90 degrees. Uh, on all sides, and of course the part we just made fits in there quite nicely on this side. On the other side, there's probably a little bit, a little bit more tweaking that maybe could be done, but maybe not. I mean, uh, just a little bit of finger pressure seems to get it to fit in there quite nicely, so uh, may not really be necessary to uh, to do any more tweaking on this. Now, one thing I do need to do. 
this is my original part. You might have even noticed it off to the side. Now, this is the one that I uh, drilled in backwards uh, and needed and caused me to have to remake the part. And on this side here, I've got uh, a, uh, a center line drawn out. This side is 20 millimeters in size. So one thing I have to do here, and where the surface plate comes in handy, is to lay this against here and then build up a gauge block. And you can just run the pin across there. Uh, now, of course, there are other ways of doing it. I mean, if you've got a calibrated steady finger, you can certainly... Uh, you know, hold a pin and lay your finger and run it across. Uh, and of course, there's some additional tools out there uh, that will hold a pin and, and help you uh, uh, maintain your distance. Uh, but I found uh, I found this works quite well. Uh, unfortunately, for the handedness that I've got here, I don't know if you'll be able to see me do this layout. But we'll go ahead and give it a try uh, again. Just run this along here. And that pretty much gives me my center line right there. Uh, like I said, we're looking for 20 millimeter. The, the height of the part is 20 millimeters. Uh, and we want the center line at, at 10 millimeters. Of course, this part has not been trimmed down yet. But once the part is trimmed down, we'll be at, uh, uh, have the correct center height for the part. Okay, one other item uh, that I'll also go ahead and cover is what's called a height gauge. Now I have to zoom this out a little bit. Essentially, what a all a height gauge is, is a tool for measuring the height above the surface plate. Uh, and, of course, it relies on the fact that the surface plate is very accurately... Uh, Round and of course this has a flat base and of course the type that I've got is digital uh, there are some uh, analog types uh, out there as well but of course these come in quite handy uh, there's a couple of uses that the height gauge can be used for uh, when you're building an airplane uh, now of course one use that's common in metalworking is you can set a height and then this is a carbide edge here and you can use that to scratch a reference line. Now of course you don't want to do that generally on aluminum uh, because obviously that can lead to stress risers and, and could result in cracking. Though I have used it a few times for that purpose uh, when I've got larger holes to drill and I know that whatever scribe line I put in there uh, is going to get drilled out anyway. Uh, but the more common use for me is to use it for verifying dimensions of parts. Now this particular part was, uh, uh, the specification is basically 20 by 30. Of course the 20 side we're sort of going to get automatically because I've got 20 millimeters drawn here and all I've got to do is cut that off. Uh, but this side is going to be dependent upon the calculations that I made. And uh, we want 30 millimeters height on that. So. Uh, we'll go ahead and lay that up against there and bring it down and we'll see what we've got. And I'm showing, at least on that side, about 30.46 30 millimeters. And if I come over to this side, I'm showing about 30.46 again. So I'm within about a half a millimeter of my target. Uh, which is definitely more than adequate for, for a part like this. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's something that you know, can make things a little bit easier uh, for measurement. It's definitely not a requirement. Uh, but it uh, can be useful. And of course, if you didn't have something like this, of course, you would find uses for, for a tool, for a setup like this, uh, you know, going way beyond error you know, airplanes, uh, you know, having a very accurate surface, reference surface to take measurements from is, is, uh, is very useful. So I think at this point, I think this covers everything that I wanted to discuss as far as the, the techniques that uh, I have been using for, uh, for fabricating parts for my airplane. Uh, you know, there's definitely simpler ways to do it or uh, other ways to do it. 
uh, using uh, using simpler tools. But on the other hand, uh, I think just about everything I've shown here in terms of measurement tools are really very inexpensive anymore. Again, uh, I don't think anything uh, you couldn't find uh, would be over a hundred dollars. Uh, I mean, of course, for a hundred dollars, you get what you pay for. I mean, you're not going to get the quality of a Sterrett or a Metatulu. But I think for, uh, uh, for for the needs of someone that's uh, building an airplane or just doing a little home shop, uh, having a set of measurement tools uh, like a surface plate, uh, height gauge, gauge blocks, uh, can, uh, can certainly make things a lot easier and, and, uh, and a little bit more fun. So I hope this uh, little demonstration is useful, and if you've got any other questions, uh, just leave a, uh, leave a comment.